What if you were enslaved by a foreign ruler who claimed to be your benefactor, but who actually punished and killed you and your people? This was the nightmare of millions of Congolese under King Leopold II of Belgium. Welcome to History on Fleet. Today we will explore the diabolical deeds of King Leopold II of Belgium and his infamous rule over his own private colony in Central Africa, called the Congo Free State. In the late 19th century, a royal named King Leopold II ascended to power in Belgium, driven by an insatiable hunger for wealth, prestige, and influence. His gaze extended far beyond his own borders, and he was irresistibly drawn to Africa and its abundant resources. But this tale takes a captivating twist. King Leopold II skillfully adorned himself in the cloak of philanthropy, masquerading as a benevolent leader on a noble mission to bring civilization and progress to the Congo. The promise seemed too good to be true, and indeed it was. Behind the shimmering facade of charity, Leopold concealed his true intentions. As we journey deeper into the annals of history, a chilling truth emerges. King Leopold II masterminded a grand plan of exploitation, intricately woven to accumulate unimaginable wealth and power. In the year 1885, Leopold established his personal colony, the Congo Free State. But there was nothing free about it. The Congolese people would soon face the nightmarish horrors lurking beneath Leopold's rule, a grim reality they could never have fathomed. Leopold II was not interested in the Congo for its people or its culture. He was only interested in its natural resources, especially rubber, which was in high demand in Europe and America for the production of tires, hoses, belts, and other rubber goods. To exploit the Congo's rubber wealth, he created a system of government corruption in the name of economic exploitation, known by critics as the Red Rubber System. This system enslaved the Congolese population and forced them to work for his benefit. He divided the Congo into two zones, one under direct state control and the other under private companies that brought concessions from him. In both zones, he claimed all the vacant land as his property and demanded the local people pay him taxes in the form of rubber. He set arbitrary quotas for each village and region, regardless of their population or resources. He also recruited several black officials, called capitas, to organize and supervise the local labor. But extracting rubber was not easy. It required cutting the vines and collecting the sap in buckets, then smoking it over a fire to make solid balls of rubber. This process was time-consuming, exhausting, and dangerous, as workers had to venture into the dense forest where they faced wild animals, diseases, and hostile tribes. Leopold did not care about the hardships of the Congolese workers. He only cared about maximizing his profits, and if they failed to meet his quotas or resisted his rule, he used violence and terror to enforce his will. He employed a colonial army called the Force Publique, composed of white officers and black soldiers, recruited from different ethnic groups, some of them notorious for their cruelty and cannibalism. He also allowed the private companies to have their own militias, which often worked together with the Force Publique to oppress the people. The punishments for failing or resisting were horrific. Workers were beaten or whipped with a leather whip called a chicot which would tear off their flesh and leave permanent scars. Hostages were taken to ensure prompt collection, and punitive expeditions were sent to destroy villages that refused. Women were abused, mutilated, and killed. And to prove that they had killed someone who disobeyed or escaped, the soldiers had to bring back their severed hands as evidence. This gruesome practice became so widespread that it turned into a kind of currency. Soldiers would cut the hands off men, women, and children, alive or dead, and use them to pay for their bonuses, to make up for their missed quotas, or to replace the people who were forced to work in labor camps. Some soldiers even hunted for hands instead of rubber, because it was easier and more profitable. But that's not all. The Congolese people also suffered unimaginable atrocities such as torture, rape, mutilation, and massacres. One eyewitness, a Catholic priest named Tswambe, described how a state official named Leon Fives terrorized a village along the river. All blacks saw this man as the devil of the equator. From all the bodies killed in the field, you had to cut off the hands. He wanted to see the number of hands cut off by each soldier, who had to bring them in baskets. A village which refused to provide rubber would be completely swept clean. As a young man, I saw Fives' soldier, Molili, 
then guarding the village of Boyaka. Take a net, put ten arrested natives in it, attach big stones to the net, and make it tumble into the river. Rubber causes these torments. That's why we no longer want to hear its name spoken. Another officer recounted how he ordered his men to decapitate the villagers and hang their heads on palisades as a warning. He also made them hang the women on wooden crosses. Leopold II was not satisfied with just mutating and exploiting the Congolese people. He also wanted to control and intimidate them. Prisons were established in every state or company station in the Congo, where Leopold's agents could imprison anyone who disobeyed, resisted, or failed to meet the rubber quotas. These prisons were in terrible condition, overcrowded, filthy, and disease-ridden. Many prisoners died of starvation, illness, or torture. Some were deported to forced labor camps, where they faced even worse treatment. Hostage-taking was another practice used to force workers to collect rubber. Leopold never proclaimed it an official policy, but he provided a manual to each station in the Congo with a guide on how to take hostages and coerce local chiefs. The hostages could be men, women, children, elders, or even the chiefs themselves. They were often kept in chains or cages and threatened with death or mutilation if their relatives did not comply with Leopold's demands. But not all Congolese submitted to Leopold's tyranny. Some fought back and resisted his oppression. They waged wars and rebellions against his forces, hoping to regain their freedom and dignity. Some of these wars and rebellions were led by native states that refused to recognize Leopold's authority over their lands. For example, Misiri's Yake Kingdom in Katanga, the Zande Federation in northern Congo, and Tipu Tips Swahili-speaking territory in eastern Congo all challenged Leopold's claims and fought against his army, the Force Publique. These wars were bloody and brutal as Leopold's forces used superior weapons and ruthless tactics to defeat their opponents. Leopold also exploited non-Congolese laborers who were brought to the Congo Free State to work under grueling conditions. He imported 540 Chinese laborers to work the railways in Congo, but 300 of them died or left their posts. He also brought Caribbean people and people from other African countries to work on the railway, in which 3,600 died in the first two years of construction from railroad accidents, lack of shelter, flogging, hunger, and disease. As if slavery, murder, and genocide were not enough, Leopold's exploitative policies also caused widespread famines that killed millions of Congolese people. The main cause of these famines was the disruption of agricultural practices by the forced labor system. Leopold's agents forced men out of their villages to collect rubber in the forest, leaving no labor available to clear new fields for planting crops. This meant that women had to continue planting worn-out fields that produced lower yields. Moreover, Leopold's agents often stole crops and farm animals from the villagers, leaving them with nothing to eat. The famines were also exasperated by natural disasters such as droughts and diseases that affected both humans and animals. For example, between 1891 and 1900, an epidemic of rinderpest killed most of the cattle in Africa, reducing the availability of meat and milk for consumption. Another example was the sleeping sickness spread by tsetse flies that infected millions of people and caused them to die of fever, weakness, and coma. The famines were so severe that some Congolese resorted to cannibalism, eating the corpses of their relatives or enemies, or even selling their own families for food. The famines also reduced the birth rate and increased the mortality rate contributing to the population decline that some estimate between 1.5 million and 13 million people. These famines were not natural disasters. They were man-made disasters caused by Leopold's greed and cruelty. This was the Congo Free State, a system of slavery, murder, and genocide that lasted from 1891 to 1906. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.